sick with the slang, sick and I'm destined for fame. Do for the fam, not for the gram. Stunt me and destined for pain. I do not front, I do not scam. Put some respect on my name. Sick like a bang, click and I bang. Y'all gon' remember the name. Y'all gon' remember the name. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of Real Talk with Zuby. Today I've got on another special guest. He is the author of the book From Democrat to Deplorable. He's also got his own podcast, Jack Murphy Live. I'd like to welcome Jack Murphy to the show. Hey, Zuby. What's up, man? Thanks for having me. I'm very well. Thanks, bro. How are you? I'm doing great, man. It's a little rainy day over here in Washington, D.C., but I'm hanging in. Yeah. I've seen you guys have got some some mad snow. Is it still snowing? No, uh, it stopped snowing, but it's just raining like crazy now. It's this, okay. this is literally the wettest year ever recorded in Washington, D.C. history. What, just like so far? Well, I mean, all of well, all 2018. It just oh, 2018. Stopped. Okay, all right. I was yeah. thinking, I was like, no, it's like, no, it's just raining like crazy, man. It's like London or Seattle or something over here now, <laughs> except without all the cool stuff. Oh, fair <laughs> enough, man. I thought DC's got some cool stuff. I haven't been yet. I'm going to visit. Everybody should come. Everybody should come. But I've lived here almost 30 years now. So it's like, you know, it, the city's grown up a lot with me. I always thought I was going to move to New York. That's like the thing. When you lived in D.C., like in the 80s and 90s, anybody that was anybody wanted to move to New York because like to live in D.C. was like the stepbrother, the ugly stepbrother or something. But uh, the city's grown up a lot, man. It's international cosmopolitan place. It's a lot of fun. Awesome, man. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you've gone from I don't know, early days up until now, whatever <laughs> parts of your life, I guess, that you think are yeah, sure. or important in your development, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, that's a, that's a big question to me. <laughs> uh, right. You know, so we could, we could probably center it around like the book and like work backwards. So like I, okay. I released, I released a book earlier this year called Democrat to Deplorable. And it's a, it's about why 9 million Obama voters who once proudly supported Barack Obama uh, pulled the lever for Donald Trump, which seems like a crazy move, right? Because everybody says that Donald Trump people are a bunch of racists and, and hate everybody. But, uh, you know, nine million people decided that uh, they they voted for Obama and they voted for Trump. And, and this was like a crazy phenomenon that I wanted to explore. So that's what I've been doing, right? I've been writing about that. I've been writing about politics. I've been writing about culture. I'd been touring the, the country, talking on uh, college campuses mm -hmm. about the book and about uh, the modern state of affairs. Uh, but it, there's a long road to get to get to that. Um, and it it's sort of a winding, winding, twisting road to go from not being on the internet at all to having over 20,000 Twitter followers and a successful book and, you know, really having like built a, a an established presence. And uh, the, the main the, the main story that most people know about is how I got docs. And so I, uh, I started writing online with a, with a pen name and, uh, Jack, Jack Murphy it is kind of, it's a play on my real name, but it's not exactly my legal name. And uh, I was writing about, uh, relationships. I started writing about, uh, you know, men and women and, and how they get to meet each other. And what, what do you do when you meet a girl? How do you have a relationship, um, sex, like, uh, anything about, about male, female dynamics. And, mm -hmm. and in, in writing about that stuff, I learned I learned that there's so much political and cultural uh, forces working against men and women coming together today. And uh, so I started exploring all that stuff. And I started exploring the relationship between culture and politics and relationships and dating and the dating markets. And uh, over time, I got sort of wrapped up into the, the Trump sphere, the Twitter sphere, the MAGA sphere. And all along the... What, what was the... Around what time was that? So that, so I started, uh, on Twitter, like in 2015, I started writing in 2015. Okay. I mean, I had, I'd written my whole life. I've always been a writer. I was like on the school newspaper and all that. And I've got many leather bound journals filled with chicken scratches and, <laughs> and stuff. I hope that, uh, no one would ever, would ever read. Um, but, uh, I finally pulled the trigger and started writing stuff around 2015. But, uh, as the election really heated up, um, you know, I have a friend of mine, Mike Cernovich, and I've known him since like way before he even got on Twitter. And so he was doing it and it just kind of sucked me into his, his, his sort of sphere and vortex. And I got to meet a ton of people like Jack Vesobic and Will Chamberlain and Cassandra Fairbanks and, and all these people who are, you know, famous in their own, in their own, uh, Twitter world now. All of those people follow me on Twitter, which is quite interesting. 
Oh yeah, you know, man, Twitter is it's wild. <laughs> I had a vir- I had a tweet go viral a couple weeks ago. And when I mean viral, I mean like global viral. Like I got yeah. tweeted into like Nigerian Twitter speaker. <laughs> like like literally of like Nigerian pop stars like retweeting it to wow. each other and like into Indonesian mom Twitter sphere. Like it's crazy, man. Twitter Twitter's yep. amazing. You'll have to let people know what the tweet was. Oh yeah, it was a it was a tweet thread, a long tweet thread about my son. I got three kids and my son uh, wants to build a gaming computer and uh, he, you know, he's got an Xbox and a PlayStation. We got laptops and stuff. I'm like, son, if you want a gaming computer, you got to pay for it yourself. Right. So he's, cause he's 12 and uh, he's like, well, dad, how do I, how do I make money? I'm like, well, when I was your age, bro, I just like pulled the lawnmower out and went door to door, like hustling, you know, cutting people's lawns. Mm-hmm. I had a paper out at age 12. I got up at five o'clock in the morning every day before school when I was in seventh grade and uh, delivered newspapers, right? And I was like, you can do that. He goes, but dad, nobody reads a newspaper anymore. <laughs> I'm like, all right, fair enough. And then he goes, but dad, it's it's winter. I'm like, okay, all right, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. But then the next day it snowed, man. It snowed like crazy. And uh, he looked at me and he's like, man, I could shovel some driveways, right? I'm like, that's right. So I sent him out uh, into the into the neighborhood with a shovel and motivation, and uh, the whole tweet thread was about that experience. It was about him coming to realize that like he can hustle, and it was about him getting out there and like knocking on doors. And first he charged like five dollars, then he charged ten dollars, and then he met another dude who was out there shoveling, and the guy's like, "How much you charging, kid?" And he's like, ten dollars. He's like, "Man, I charged thirty. I was like, "Whoa!" And then they joined up. They did a joint venture where like he's like, "This is my this is my client." But I'll let you do it and we'll split the money. And so all of a sudden he goes from five to 10 to 15. And then the next next one he does is 20. And he comes home with like a wad of cash. <laughs> and then like, and so I'm tweeting about this whole thing and it just blows up, dude. I mean, it blew up so big that the CEO of Razor, which is like one of the big tech gaming tech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He tried, he retweeted, he chimed in. He's like, you know, I remember when I first started hustling made me proud and made me think about my my history like uh, tell your son to reach out and i'll send him a headset so like oh, sick <laughs> yeah so like he's sending us gear people started sending us money i mean the thing got like hundreds of thousands of notifications it did it did like five to seven almost seven million impressions wow that's nice yeah, it's crazy like i i had been doing like 200 maybe 400 thousand a day in impressions and then since then i'm like doing i'm clocking an easy mill now every day yeah. It's weird when something just um, just catches fire on Twitter. I remember the first first time I ever had it was last year, and then last year it happened several times, and it was just so it was so weird. Like I just and you and you can tell what spheres it's going into because yeah yeah at the beginning of 2018, about 80 percent of my Twitter following was in the UK, and something like 10 15 percent was in the US. Now I have more American followers than I do uh, <laughs> in the UK. Yeah. which is just nuts. And now the same with my podcast. Most of my podcast listeners are in the, in, are in the USA. And it's weird because I never made like a conscious effort to do that. Right. I just tweeted a couple of things which happened to go viral in the US. And people, people just started following me from there. And it kind of it snowballed. And it's, oh, yeah. uh, it's just bizarre. Well, yeah. I mean, and you brought up a good point there, which is like momentum, man. Like once things start going, you just got to ride with it. And we talked about this before we started recording about, you know, you want to do a bunch of podcasts in a row and build up the momentum and get it going. And that's sort of the name of the game with social media. I mean, you got to you got to find that flow and then jump on it and then ride it and be consistent and just keep hammering it. And uh, you're right, though. The funniest part is when you see what spheres they get the, the tweets enter into. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not kidding when I'm like these like ni- like Nigerian pop stars <laughs> are like tweeting it back and forth, talking about it in like in the in their sort of like mixed English yeah. and whatever P- the local uh, pigeon English it's called. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I can't understand half of it, but I'm like <laughs> I'm like I'm liking it. And I've had this policy of like trying to hit like or reply to almost every comment that comes through. But man, this was tough, like literally tens and tens of thousands, tens of thousands. And it, you know, there's a downside to it. It like sucked all my attention dry for like yeah. two days. You know, it's yeah. hard to, it's hard to resist because people were sending my son gear and money. Like, wow. People were Venmoing him money. They were, t- they were, they paid him to go shovel senior citizens driveways in our wow. neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Like people from across the world were paying my son to do charity for like senior citizens in the neighborhood. So I didn't want to miss any notifications, right? Yeah. Like man, there's money in there. There's like yeah, literally yeah. money in the notifications. And so that, that thing blew up. But the reason why it blew up, and this is, 
um, part of how I think my audience has really been growing lately is like I've been telling stories that people can relate to. And uh, the, this story really resonated with people because um, it, it hit on a lot of like common human stories that we have. Like one, it was like nostalgia, right? It like harkened people back to the 80s or 90s in their childhood when they went out and shoveled driveways and cut lawns and stuff. And nostalgia is a very powerful storytelling force, as I'm, I'm sure you know. Uh, and then it's also about the hustle, right? It was like the good old capitalistic hustle, like get up off your, off your butt and go make something happen, solve a problem. Uh, and people can relate to that. And then people can relate to the parenting aspect and like mm -hmm. seeing your son sort of come of age. You know, he went, this was the first time he ever went out and made any money. Yeah. Right. So like, he was like a boy becoming a man. I think one of my tweets was, uh, this is better than a bar mitzvah. Like I was so <laughs> proud. I was, I was, it was like his, his moment of like, he came home and he laid, he laid his like $84 out on the bed and like spread it out. And he's like, yeah. look at me, dad. I'm like, yeah, good for you, man. That's so awesome. like, uh, the story, man, the story really resonated with people. And, uh, that's what I've been trying to focus on with my tweeting is, uh, and my, and my writing and the podcast is like, Telling stories that people can relate to. And a lot of that has to do with family, uh, has to do with parenting. You know, uh, a lot of my t recent tweets have been about uh, the bittersweetness of parenting, you know, like how how it comes and goes so quickly. And and sometimes it's hard, but, you know, you got to you got to du double down in those moments because when they're gone, you're going to miss them. And, you know, these are these are all things that people can relate to as well. And uh, if there's there's one thing I feel like I've really learned in the last uh, six months after writing the book and everything is uh storytelling is the number one way to to get people to listen to what you're saying right sure. you can't you can't just be like a b c d e get it guys no you gotta like put it in a context with a narrative and characters that people can relate to and emotions that they can relate to and then uh, that story will carry the message and then people want to share it and uh, it's really powerful stuff and i I don't, I don't feel like they didn't tell us this in school, right? Like the best way to be persuasive is to, is to tell a story, yeah. you know, that's, it, it's not, it's not what they're teaching people. And it seems like such a simple concept. Um, and now I can think back when I used to watch the Oscars back before they got all, all crazy, <laughs> the, the directors and the producers and stuff would be always talking about the magic of storytelling, the magic of storytelling. And they didn't exactly know what they meant, but like, I, I totally get it now. Yeah. I mean, you probably do the same thing in your, with your lyrics and your writing and stuff. Yeah. Too. And my music. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Every, every album, certainly I'm always trying to capture where I am at that point in my life. So, you know, drawing on my experiences, where I am in the present, my future aspirations. So that's what I always try to do in my music so that hopefully I can put songs out there and people feel inspired by it. I think yeah. what it is with stories is, you know, people can insert themselves into a good story. So right. whether that's someone in your story, for example, relating to being you, the father, or relating to being the kid, right? You can kind of insert yourself in either of those. Right. And either way, it, it's, a, it's a happy story. It's got a, it's, it's almost like a parable, right? Like it's got a, oh, it's yeah. got a message in it. It's yeah. a true story, but it's kind of yeah. like a parable. It's got, it's got a message, but it's just, it's very simple. I think I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on this a lot more as you go into your book and how it came about. But it also hits on that whole issue of expectation and what's the word I'm looking for? Entitlement mm, versus yeah. hard work, entrepreneurship and doing something to get something, which right. is kind of like a, it shouldn't necessarily be a hot topic, but it's a little bit of a hot topic right now because Definitely. You've, you've kind of got people who are a little bit split down a line of personal responsibility versus blaming the system or other people so you've right. kind of got a lot of people just going look whether you're talking health whether you're talking wealth fitness career whatever like you can do it it doesn't matter where you are it doesn't matter where you're coming from you can do it don't make excuses don't worry about your your race your skin color your your gender your sex like whatever like work hard get good at something work hard give people value you'll be rewarded you'll be successful um so you've got that and then you've got another group of people who are also large and very vocal, who would like to just say, no, nothing is, this isn't the, in, this isn't about the individual. This is about the system. This is about the collective. This is about the, the patriarchy, the white dominance, the hierarchy, like whatever words people want right. to use. Right. It's like, no, it's the system. It's the system. It's the system. We need to change the system. And right. sometimes when people say that enough, it's like, you don't even know 
whenever I'm talking to someone who holds those points, sometimes I'm I'm always trying to get them to be specific. Yeah. Right. Because if they're if they're talking, the patriarchy is holding me down. I'm like, what is the patriarchy? Like, what do you mean? And they just throw out they throw out words, but they never really like explain it. I'm like, okay, tell me like what specifically, like what is what's the roadblock? Like what is stopping you right. achieving this thing? And often oftentimes you keep going, you keep drilling down and like there's no there. Yeah, yeah. Once people run out of the stuff they learned in their uh, sociology classes, like they have <laughs> they have no individual argument. If somebody does, then it's like, okay, cool. Like there's something that can be done here. If you can give me a specific example, then it's like, okay, cool. We can actually and hopefully needless to say, I don't want anyone being discriminated against. I don't want the system to be unfair. I don't want the system to be deeply biased. And so if you can point out a specific company or university or individual right. even who's who's being discriminatory. Right. It's let's like, fix okay, it. Yeah, let's let's fix it. But yeah. if you're just gonna give me these general ideas that seem completely unsolvable and also seem not to really exist in my personal experience, then I can't I can't help you. Right. Well it you really bring up a very interesting point. And like I, I I've always asked the women around me who complain about the patriarchy and like female oppression. I asked them, I said, well, tell me exactly how in your life you've experienced this oppression. And they're like, uh, yeah. And then they've got no answer. Right. But they're like, no, there's other people. And no, it's the system. And no, it's this other thing. And then you'll notice too, that they always use the passive voice. It was always like, was, op was oppressed or, you know, was held back. Or, and it's never, it's never by a specific thing and it's never by a specific policy. It's always like some, some untouchable, unknowable specter that's like ruining everyone's lives, but no one can put mm -hmm. their finger on it. And, uh, you know, it, that, that concept was wrapped into the same thread that we were just talking about and why it went so viral. Uh, and then also the book that I wrote is also very much wrapped around those same concepts. Uh, and it really does seem to be a defining theme uh, in Western culture right now, you know, I can't speak for China and whatever, but I definitely yeah, yeah. know, I definitely know that in the, in the United States and from what I can glean from England and from, uh, Australia, at least too, uh, you know, these same conversations are all, are all taking place, you know, and obviously like, uh, Western Europe and Scandinavia and stuff, um, you know, who's who's in charge who has the power who's benefiting from the power and they're seeing all of reality through the lens of power dynamics and mm -hmm. not focusing on the power that individuals have uh and not focusing on self uh, on autonomy or liberty or your uh, individual responsibility you know that those are classic dividing lines in the united states politically speaking uh and the democrats right now are, are really veering hard to the left in terms of abdication of social or of individual responsibility and then more expectations of like societal support to remedy these past issues and you know uh, I'll, I'll be honest, like the African-American community in the United States, man, they, they've gotten a real uh, structural raw deal. Like that's yeah. one well, that's one element I can look to and be like, yeah, I can see how there were <laughs> there were laws and policies and procedures in place that were oppressive. I mean, there's yes. just no there's just no question about it. And women, women, too. I think it's really important to say here that I'm not talking. I don't think either of us are talking about the whole history of the country, let alone the world. Right. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that people have been on a remotely level playing field for hundreds of years. What I'm saying is that in 2019, those factors, it's not saying that there's not still some overhang and there might still be some, you know, things that happened in the past that are currently affecting the present, of course. However, the idea that the entire system is specifically built and rigged, you know, to benefit the quote unquote straight Man. white male the That's straight me. white male <laughs> archetype right it, it's it's like it's like an archetype it's almost religious at this stage oh yeah um it's kind of like well people can protest people can shout people can scream but i'm kind of like what do you what do you want like you know it, the us is certainly more there's a, there's more racial tension in the us than there is say in the uk which isn't surprising given the his, given the history Mm. But it's interesting because in the UK, I mean, there's there's quite a lot of people in the UK who feel who feel the same way. And it's not like most black people here are not the descendants of slaves like they might be if you're talking about uh, black Americans. So 
when people start talking about it here in the UK or it's even people who have lived very similar lives to me or whatever, it's weird because sometimes I'm just like, sometimes someone says something and I'm just like, what, what are you even talking about? Like, do, yeah. we live in, do we live in the same country? Like, I've traveled to, I've been to more towns and cities in the UK with my music than most people will ever be. I've been to 60, 70 different towns and cities, north, south, east, west. And my experience has been the UK does not have a big racial problem. Or if they right. do, they're, if, if they do, they're hiding it so well that, <laughs> that you it's didn't, not, you know, you I've didn't met, even notice. I've, Literally, I've met hundreds of thousands of people, literally hundreds of thousands of people I've personally met, spoken to. And, you know, I've, I've, I went to school here. I went to university here. So did lots of my friends. And it's very weird because, you know, lots of us, you know, if I'm speaking of, uh, you know, my, my fellow my fellow black friends or Asian friends or whatever, lots of us are just like, yeah, it's fine. Like, there's no, what yeah. are you guys talking about? Like, what's the problem? But then you've got other people who are, who are you know, they see it everywhere. They see it daily. And I think it's really much in people's perceptions. I think so much of it is in, in people's heads. Like it's not out there in real life, but I don't know, they'll be boarding a bus and someone on the bus will look at them and they will interpret that as like mm, mm -hmm. something racist, right? Like if someone, if I, if I board a bus and someone looks at me, right, I'm not, I don't even, my brain doesn't even like register it. I'm just like, okay, right. someone looked at me, you know what I mean? Yeah. If some, you know, if someone's, if someone's there like shouting racial slurs at you or something, I'm like, okay, like that's, this is a clear thing. But you know, someone's just like, yeah, but you know, just the way they looked at me and I'm kind of like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, how did they, how did they look at you? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like I, I don't, I just, well, I, and I think, I think that brings up a bunch of good points. I mean, one of them is that, you know, we all have the power to control the way that we feel, right? Like that person is choosing to feel that way by 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 malinterpreting that facial expression that somebody gave them and uh that's that's a weird place to be you know uh, one of the things that i really like about uh, my corner of the internet and twitter sphere is that uh, one of the main focal points is like, you know, take responsibility for everything in your life, but yeah. including, including the way that you feel and you can't necessarily like, con like control your initial emotions, but you can control the way that you react to them and then what you do with them and how you process them. And I think that that's one of the central tenets of like, uh, you know, the manosphere for lack of a better term, you know, men's self-improvement is what I try to call it these days or po positive masculinity is, is about like, it's not about stoicism and not having emotions. And it's not about being a, a freaking rock right? Yeah. It's about, it's about being able to, uh, take the inputs that you get, process them, and then, then use them in a way that's beneficial for you. And in many cases, that means just discarding whatever random thing that you thought, because our thoughts betray us, you know, it's, uh, and, and we're not held, we shouldn't be held responsible for the things that we think we should only be held responsible for the things that we do. And so you see somebody look at you funny and you get mad about it. Well, you know, that's all on you. A, even if they were looking at you funny, you can just discard that and move on. It's not impacting your life in any way whatsoever. And B, you don't know what that other person is thinking. And that's another thing that I've learned too, which is whatever your assumption is about the, somebody else's motivations, they're generally wrong, right? Like, why was that, why was that person late? Oh, well, they hate me and they don't want to respect me. Or, <laughs> or maybe... Or maybe there was traffic, or maybe their sister got sick, or maybe the, she got in a fight with her boyfriend, or a million other reasons why they may have like perceived to disrespect you. And and I've I've been extolling my guys, my my followers and stuff to like just try to use your creative energy to come up with an excuse that you like a real reason that would happen to you. Like if you disrespected somebody by accident, but it was because you know, your girlfriend's tire was flat and you changed it for her before you ran out. Well, like that could have happened to the other person too. So like, I'm really been trying myself and my, and my followers to like, uh, really change the way that we, the stories that we tell ourselves in our own heads, really a lot of these political divides that we're having are based around this mindset. Uh, it's like you and I are talking and my son was talking about and the world that, that appreciated the Twitter thread that I had was talking about the individual responsibility, looking inwards for your answers and your solutions, uh, taking action to fix your situation, to remedy whatever problem that you have and, and, and trying not to worry about anybody else to the extent, except for like, how do I solve other people's problems? Right. So that I can make some money. Um, whereas like the other side of, of the country is constantly worried about how everybody else is acting, everybody else is feeling, everybody else 
else is thinking, what everybody else is doing, who anybody else is talking to, who, what book you read, what, what tweet you liked, who you follow on Twitter. And it's what, like, what a, hat you wear, right? What hat you wear. And it's like a total obsession with what other people are doing when really, if they just took the time to focus on themselves and what they wanted and how to achieve their goals, they would find that we live in a system which rewards that type of behavior. And, you know, just to wrap up the earlier thread that we had, I mean, the equal opportunity under the law has existed in the United States, at least for a number of decades now, you know, black people couldn't vote. Women couldn't vote. People couldn't get, you know, credit cards or open bank accounts on their own or whatever. And all that has changed. Uh, it's against the law to discriminate against, any, uh, discriminate against anybody. And if there's a violation, they get pilot, they get, you know, they get punished. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the equality under the law has been a thing for, for decades. And I think, what's happened is that there's this like this army that's been built up uh, and now it doesn't quite know what to do with itself. Now that, right. now that the equality under the law has been achieved now, it's mm-hmm. like, Oh my God, what, what else do we do to attack and to fight? Do you know when I think this happened, especially with the timing is cause I think the final law that people could say was discriminatory directly mm-hmm. was the gay marriage one. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. So I think that once that pillar fell, yeah. You had all these people, all these activists, all these people pursuing, you know, equality, diversity, tolerance, whatever they wanted to call it for the first time ever. Right. You know what? Mission accomplished. Right. What do I right? do now? There are, there are no more. There are now no more laws that I'm certainly aware of yeah. in the USA nor the UK, which discriminate against anybody based on any immutable characteristics. I'm not aware of a, a single one. I think those have all been gone now. Those are all gone now, like down, down to marriage. It's, it's done. And it's like, people still have this energy, this outrage, this anger or whatever, which, you know, there was a time in history where it was like, yeah, this is completely justified. Like these, this is unfair, but it's now like, you've still got, yeah, like you said, you've still got those people and they're trying to find something else to protest about or direct it towards and it's like i mean you can see even in some of the marches like they'll have these marches i don't know like this women's march they do in america i still don't know what it's for i legit i legitimately do not know what the march is for right and i I don't think the people do either because i look at the signs they're holding and all of their signs have nothing to do with each other there's nothing there specifically it's just like okay you all you have in common is seemingly is you don't like Trump or you don't like Republicans. Right. right. That's, that. that's the thread. That's the common thread. It's yeah, outra- out- an outrage it. thread. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Well, it's very interesting, the, the gay marriage thing. Once uh, gay marriage was off the table, like I voted Democrat my whole life, right? I was a Democrat all the way through, uh, you know, I at least voted for Barack Obama the first term. By the second term, I was a little, little disenfranchised, but, or, uh, disaffected. But uh, the gay marriage thing is what really opened the door, I think, for a lot of people to change parties because, you know, there's a lot of people I know who thought that gay, you know, gay marriage should be legal. It's like, Hey, if you want to, if you want to sign a contract and get it sanctioned by the state, like, I mean, more power to you, do whatever you want. I don't care. You can sign a contract with your, you know, dining room table for all I care. But to prevent people from doing that, I thought was an injustice. And so when that became, when that became uh, uh, off the table, um, and then also with the uh, marijuana decriminalization in America seeming to, seemingly imminent in the next few years, uh, these were, um, these were issues that were really important to me. And if you believed in, in gay marriage and in, in pot decriminalization, you had to be a Democrat. There was no choice. Mm-hmm. Uh, but once those issues came off the table, then it's kind of opened the door for a, a realignment. I mean, they had like the, the gay flag up at the Republican National Convention in 2016. Uh, you know, Donald Trump had like a gay flag up on a podium with him. I mean, like, you know, the 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 end of like LGBT whatever discrimination, it seems to be on the way in here, at least legally in the United States for sure. And so once that's done, it's like, oh, well, I don't have to be a Democrat anymore. I can open my eyes and and think about other possibilities. And I think that the United States is going through like a very tumultuous shift in these political coalitions. Uh, and you are absolutely right to nail it that like the gay marriage thing was was really important and impactful in so many ways beyond just the gay marriage element of the law and of the decision um, because it's really thrown us into this sort of social chaos where nobody knows what to protest anymore. So they protest things and they make up demons. And so yeah. let me, let me tie all this back together. This is, this is all going to come back around to my story. Also, there's these Antifa 
protesters in the United States, well, I guess they're all over the world, right? And they're, you know, they say they're like anti-fascist, but they turn out to be like the most fascist of them all. And uh, they were following along with uh, those people I mentioned earlier, Jack Sobic and Cassandra and, and Mike Cernovich and stuff. And uh, they found a picture of me that was uh, in a, a group photo with those guys and this other woman, man, Chelsea Manning, who is a, a transsexual that, that became very infamous in the United States because he at the time, Bradley, his name was at the time like um like stole a bunch of top secret information or something from the from the united states military and he got thrown in prison and he was in solitary confinement and uh, while he was in solitary confinement he decided he was a woman and so began undergoing like his transformation into a woman while he was in solitary confinement in prison and then obama and then obama obama pardoned him or her Mm -hmm. chelsea and so she was out and cassandra just happens to know a bunch of random people so we all ended up in a picture together one night and uh the Antifa people saw this picture eventually and they didn't like the fact that uh, Chelsea Manning, who's uh, supposedly like a progressive lefty was in this picture with a bunch of MAGA, you know, new right, new journalist types. And they knew everybody in the photo except for me. So they set out to figure out who I was. Oh gosh. And and they, uh, they, I saw pictures of like everybody's head circled with like numbers over each head and like identification. And they're like, who's this guy with the beard? Wow. And they they circulated it through their their in information networks and, uh, you know, through the power of the Internet, they were able to to uh, find a picture of me uh, that was not associated with Jack Murphy, that was not associated with any of my writing, but was associated with my real professional work, which okay. at the time was. I ran charter schools in Washington, D.C. Like I'm a charter school executive director where I turn around some of the worst performing schools in the city and help poor urban black kids get better educations. That's what I dedicated my life to for 10 years. How dare, how dare you? You, 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 you will pick it. Horrible (laughs) horrible person. I'm, I'm writing about all this stuff and I'm writing about MAGA stuff. I'm writing, I'm questioning like, should we have open borders? Should we have uh, sanctuary cities? I'm questioning feminism. I'm questioning all kinds of stuff. And at the same time, I'm also helping kids in the city of Washington, DC get better educations. And like, dude, I would go into like the worst schools, like yeah. trash cans on fire in the hallways and every teacher quitting and the worst scores in the city and turn them around in like two years. Awesome. And the mayor would come congratulate me and all this. It's like all on the record and legit. So Antifa finds this connection of Jack Murphy with the MAGA crew. They found my, my, my professional persona or, per, you know, identity and they doxed me. They doxed me to my employer because not only did they find that picture of me, but they also found a picture of me happening to stand by standing by Richard Spencer, who's an alt right guy. Oh no! But I was just taking pictures of them. Like I was at a protest, and they were there, and Antifa was there, and I was just taking pictures, and I was reporting on it, like periscoping and everything. But somebody took a picture and happened to catch me standing next to Richard Spencer. So they're like. John Goldman is a Nazi, alt-right, oh, racist, gosh. you know, alt-right supporter. He's alt-right. He shouldn't be around our children. And uh, they did that all on Twitter publicly. And so within like five, within like three or four hours, I was suspended from my job. And two months later, I was fired. And now I'm known in my f- education circles as the alt-right Nazi. Oh, gosh. Even though I just spent 10 years like helping poor black kids in the city get better educations. And I, I was successful successful at doing it i'm also half jewish so like the nazi bit doesn't really apply either and it was all just a big fabrication and it goes back to the point that we were making earlier which is they don't know what to protest anymore they don't know what to be upset about anymore and they looking for demons everywhere and they're looking for dragons and this just chick lacy mccauley that docks me she thought she was slaying some dragon but in reality she was like hurting a guy that was helping the people that she thought that she was trying to protect mm-hmm. and this is where we are today where uh, a good man a family man like myself a person that was dedicated to public service that was helping kids like literally helping children that was my job uh has been completely uh defamed and slandered and had my income and job taken away from me and attacked and reputation ruined <clears throat> and everything that i've worked for my whole entire career just pissed right down the toilet because yeah. some chick on twitter thought that I was a Nazi and told everyone I was a Nazi and guess what they believed her. So here's a question. Did the school, so I'm obviously assuming you defended yourself against these allegations, yes. but did the school, did they really believe these people on Twitter based off of their frankly minimal evidence inverted commas, or right. was it that they just wanted to 
get the heat and the spotlight off of them? Did they just give in to the pressure or did they actually think, oh, he is associated with these people with, um, well, not these people, but that person. Right. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a very interesting question. And so, um, so at the time I had moved from not working with individual schools to working with the regulator. So like I was responsible for, I was like the head financial regulator for the whole charter school sector. So it was my job to help all the schools at that point. And that organization was completely staffed with hundred percent hard left progressives, like so bad that they like had therapists for crying, you know, staff members the day after Trump was elected. And like, oh gosh, you know, like they were literally bawling tears, everybody in the office. And so once I got the the taint of alt right stuck on me, there was no way I because because what happens is people read the first story and that's the story that they believe in every other piece of evidence that comes up afterwards, people discard and they forget about it. And so when they all heard Nazi, 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 you know, I was toast. There was no way I could go back there. They would never, ever, ever have me back. And so they did an investigation and they and they came they came themselves, the, their investigators to sort of lose the Nazi bit um, because it, it was on the record very clearly. Like I've written out against the alt right. I've written articles against Richard Spencer. I've been very vocal and it's been in the New Yorker and it's been in the Atlantic like Jack Murphy is against alt right. Like anybody that knows anything about yeah. this little little field knows that. Um, so they abandoned that, and what they did was they zeroed in on my writings about uh, sanctuary cities in the United States, and they zeroed in on my writings about feminism. And so they they fired me because they said that uh, <laughs> I couldn't. They couldn't have somebody in the oh work there who believe that sanctuary cities were wrong. Okay. San- a sanctuary city is illegal. <laughs> right oh what they're doing is illegal and they're fostering illegal behavior and so, so i'm saying just to explain it especially for people in the uk who don't know yeah. what a sanctuary city is can you yeah. just explain sure. that so a sanctuary city is a jurisdiction like a county or state or city in the united states uh or yeah where uh if you're an illegal uh alien or an undocumented citizen you know, not citizen undocumented person who who shouldn't be here and doesn't have legal permission to be in the country and you get arrested uh for a crime they will not cooperate with federal immigration authorities they won't be like hey we caught this guy robbing you know this house and he's also illegal immigrant you should come scoop him up and take him back to his country they refuse to coordinate and cooperate with federal immigration authorities so what they're saying is who is they is that just the citizens or no the state no the state governments the the state governments itself yeah the police departments the county you know the county sheriffs etc so they have decided that they don't want to comply with federal law, right? And they don't want to cooperate with federal law enforcement. How is that allowed? I don't, it's not. I don't actually, I mean, it's it's, I a, it's that a, that a violation. Just... I mean, the only way for them to enforce it really would be to you know withhold federal funding. And I think that there's been talk about that. Like that's Obama would have never done that, but the Trump administration has, I think, explored ways to withhold federal funding as a way to you know punish the states that do it. But it's a completely illegal thing that they do. And it's ridiculous, you know, because what it does is, is it says to people that are illegal, they're like, well, we can go to this city and we know if we get caught speeding or if we get caught robbing somebody or whatever, rape, that we won't get turned over and sent back back to, you know, wherever we came from. And uh, I wrote about how this, you know, is that a good thing? <laughs> and uh, and the thing is, is like my, the, the place that I work for, since they were, we serve a ton of illegals in Washington, D.C. And we serve a ton of minority students in Washington, D.C. And so we have a lot of illegal and undocumented people in the district going to schools because there's a Supreme Court law that says you have to educate every kid that shows up at the front door. Okay. So all I did was say, maybe sanctuary cities are wrong, but I also complied with the law in every other way. And I never discriminated against anybody or did anything like that because my schools were like a hundred percent you know, uh, minority. So, uh, it was just all just ludicrous. And I was literally specifically fired for, and in writing, like from them in writing, uh, for having an opinion that a political point of view that didn't align with the organization's mission. Wow. Yeah. And it's a government job It's a government job too, which makes them fire me illegal. This is probably something we can, we can talk about after the podcast, but I would have thought there's some kind of legal recourse for that given that it's not a private 
company right. or and there, organization. And there is there is legal recourse, um, and I've talked to a number of lawyers. Uh, you know, the thing is, it's like super super expensive. And at this yeah. point, I've made the calculation that like I'm just willing to close that chapter in my life and and yeah. move on and move on because you know it was a lot of stress to deal with man you know like you lose your career you lose your job it's six-figure job and all of a sudden it's just like poof it's gone you've got kids and child support and a house and everything and it's gone and um, I'm finally in a place now where uh, I have uh, embraced my new renegade outlaw uh, <laughs> persona maximally um, I am 100% committed to selling books and selling uh, courses and e-commerce and and doing the online thing fully um i've doubled down on twitter on the podcasting on the blogs on everything and I'm, i've taken this and this is what i like to teach my guys too which is i took this moment of crisis and i turned it into opportunity for myself um because there was a lot of spotlight shined on me for for a hot minute there and it's also given me a great story uh, a great narrative you know like i was doxxed and swatted and banned i was banned from coaching little league you know because of all this too wow. and uh yeah, yeah, the, that's it, it. Went deep, man. Like, not only was I ban- I was banned from coaching little league after I had coached my son for five years to the city championships, all stars, almost won the state championship. Like, we were hardcore. They banned me from coaching little league, and my landlord tried to evict me because because of all of this stuff. Like, it was a total assault on my entire life, on my job, my name, my reputation, my income, my security, my family, my community service, my things I do with my children, plus where I live. All of this because I appeared in a photo with a guy they didn't like. You literally appeared in the photo. You didn't, you didn't right. pose in the photo. You weren't no. hanging out. It was, no. and even if you were, I know you were not, yeah. even if you were, like for all of this to happen, is you know the idea that these people think they're the good guys right. is insane to me like that's right. that's some that's the stage where i've reached i mean i i live in the uk yeah so i don't vote i'm not a democrat i'm not a republican any of that but just watching stuff evolve over the past three to four years it's just gone nuts i mean i remember i was in i was in the usa in 2008 when uh, just before Obama won, right when uh, it was all the the whole Obama mania, right? I was right. I was in, I right. was in the U.S. at that time, and I remember that specifically. And I was in Chicago as well, so you know I remember you know all the the hope campaign, the you know change, like. And at that stage, I mean, this is not long ago. This is like ten years ago. I mean, you know, the Democrat Party and the Republican Party both seemed, as far as I could tell, pretty normal, right? Like. All this stuff that we're talking about, right? This crazy rage, this anger, this hatred, it wasn't prevalent. You know, it was like right. I could buy, I could, you could buy that they were the good guys. I was like, okay, Obama, yeah, he he seems like the good guy. You know what I mean? Like it, right. it made sense. And then, to me, it's just been weird because people call Trump a lot of things, okay? And there's plenty of criticisms of Donald Trump, but in the past two years, before he won. And then the two years since he's been in office, if I, if someone's going to ask me which side, like I don't like taking political sides, I really don't. But if someone's going to ask me which side is behaving badly, right. it's not, it's not the red guys. Like that's the right, thing I'm, I'm right. looking at. I'm seeing these stories coming out. I'm seeing the slander. I'm seeing the physical attacks. I'm seeing just the horrible stuff people are saying and whatnot. And I'm like, you know, everyone's trying to frame it as you know, this is all the, you know, this is the MAGA people, these people in their, their hats, people are trying to say that, you know, this is the, this is the new KKK hood and all this, despite yeah. how many, despite how many black people own those hats and how many Hispanic people own and wear those hats proudly. Um, and it's just like, people are just frothing at the mouth. It's like any sort of rationality or calm or just reasonable, reasonable discussion. It's like, it's just, it's going out the window. Like, I don't know what the climate's like you know, you're in, you're in DC. So you're kind of at ground zero. It's going so far. It's going too far. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. if you've got criticisms, fair enough. If you want to protest some specific thing, fair enough. But this whole idea of trying to paint, I don't know, what was it? 60 million Americans who voted for him? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If you're trying to paint 60 million of your fellow citizens, your neighbors, your friends, people you go to school with, people you try, you work with, you're trying to suddenly demonize all of these people who who have been there, right? It's not like these are new people that have come in the country. You suddenly hate your neighbor who you were getting on with three years ago. Right, because, exactly. You, you know what I mean? I'm just like, 
it feels it feels bad. It does, and it feels like it's getting worse. Uh, and Twitter both helps and hurts it. Uh, new media helps and hurts it. The rate of information exchange helps and hurts. Uh, everybody is just sort of getting whipped up into a, more of a frenzy. And, you know, uh, people people are, are rightfully ringing alarm bells and I'm feeling it. And like, look, I'm I'm like I'm like a perfect example of a victim, even though I won't act like it, of this culture war where, you know, they literally like a, a character assassinated me and took away everything that was dear and important to me. But I'm not, I'm not going to be a victim about it. But people forget that in the 60s and maybe into the 70s in the United States, like thousands of bombs went off. Like people got murdered. Presidents got assassinated. Leaders got assassinated. People were getting shot on the streets. People were blowing up things at schools. People people were just going bonkers. Yeah. And and we're just luckily, thankfully, nowhere near that <coughs> level of violence yet. Uh, we've had yes, somebody got killed last summer. Yes, people. There's been like open street violence and people brawling and getting hit in the head and attempted murders. There's no question. There was this guy in California that hit people over the head with those heavy bike locks. Like to me, that's an attempted yeah. murder. Yeah, I saw um, that. We're not at this point where there's like a thousand bombs going off on college campuses right now. And I, I am afraid, however, that we are escalating towards something like that because there's very, there's very little room for conversations uh, across the aisle. And so that's something that I really focused on last fall was reaching out uh, and talking to people uh, across the country in order to bridge these divides. And one place I went to was uh, Evergreen State College in Washington State. Oh, on, okay. On the West Coast. I've heard a lot about that place. Yeah. So they had some crazy things go down there a couple of years ago um, and became sort of a flashpoint in this culture war where uh, they like forced a, a professor out uh, because they declared a day of no white people and he refused to not come to work. <laughs> and so they com complete insanity. Yeah. Yeah. Complete so, insanity. Yeah. So they established they're like, yes, a, a day with no white people because we want to just have no white people here. For this one day. And these people and, say that they're anti-racist. Right, exactly. It, it blows my mind. Yeah, it really yeah. does. And he refused, and he refused, and they had like a little riot, and and basically he got run out of town. And so I picked that place. I was like, I want to go there. I want to go there and talk to people. And I was invited to speak and lecture at a class. And I went and talked for like three hours to these kids. And we had an excellent time. I mean... They started off like cool with me, like uh, distant. But mm -hmm. by the end, man, I couldn't get them to shut up. We were all laughing <laughs> and talking. And then, like, and then, like, a good number of them came out to like a meetup that we did in Seattle that night, just to come hang out. Like, it was a huge success, and it it really meant a lot to me because I I wanted to reach out and bridge divides, and I wanted to make a personal connections with people that probably think that I'm a horrible person, and I wanted to show them really because. All of my positions and my arguments are based in individual liberty and freedom and like not hurting other people. And there's a lot of thinking that goes in, in behind all the positions that I've taken. And, and no tweet and no essay even can really do it justice. But like having a long conversation really can. And they gave me an opportunity to share my opinions on things. They grilled me. They challenged me. We went back and forth. And it was fantastic. And and I hope that I help them see that they're, they're, there's no point in fighting each other. And the best thing that we can do is talk to each other. And uh, it made me feel really good. Um, on the other side, I got like deep platform going to other universities. Like I was supposed to go speak at the university of New Mexico and like the, my bags are packed by the door, my plane tickets booked, I'm on my way. And they're like, the Dean's canceled you because it's too close to the election and we don't want to have such a controversial speaker, you know? So, oh, like, so this was before the election. Yeah, it was before, well, it was before the midterm election. So it was like oh, November, okay. November, November of 2018. Okay. Uh, and so like they didn't want to have me because, you know, he's too controversial. And then I got banned from speaking at Columbia University also because like, you know, quote unquote, I add nothing to the narrative. Like, come on, like I'm, help, <laughs> I'm helping create, I'm helping create new narratives. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So like, that's been a mission of mine, you know, like ever since I got doxxed and I got sort of dragged into this culture war 
Like it recruited me. I didn't, I didn't wake up one day and be like, I want to be a culture warrior and I want to be involved in this every day as my job and my calling. Yeah. But dude, they made, they made it, they made it happen. They thought, they thought they were slaying a dragon. Uh, but you know, like, uh, what was that? Obi-Wan Kenobi in star Wars. He's like, if you strike me down, I'll come back more powerful than ever. And that's, <laughs> and that's what's happened, man. Like, they uh, they thought they were ending me, but instead my platform has only doubled in size. My audience has doubled in size. I've toured the country, speaking at you know major universities. My writing has been featured uh, as course materials at universities, uh, and I'm speaking at three different places already coming up this year. And you know the message is just going out farther and wider and faster and accelerating now. So jokes on them. <laughs> yeah, man, for real. <laughs> I've found now that like with the com- combination of the Twitter audience getting bigger and the book and the credibility I have there, you know, people are willing to talk to me on the podcast that I, you know, probably wouldn't have been able to get, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, and um, it's just been a lot of fun meeting people and having opportunities like this to, to talk to folks. Um, yeah. But, I, but I think that the Democrat to deplorable phenomenon is going to continue. I don't think anybody who voted for Obama then for Trump is going to wake up tomorrow and decide to vote for Kamala Harris. And for those those of you who don't know, she's like a Democratic presidential hopeful who is also just like the worst of the worst progressive left lying hypocrite who doesn't really yeah, care about I anything, or anything. I still feel like I'm very much in the minority of people who sees it. Like, again, I'm not I'm not American. I don't have a dog in the fight, but I think it's weird. I mean, is something like 95 percent of black Americans vote Democrat? Oh, yeah, it's just, it's something largely, crazy like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's that's insane. I'm not yeah. saying I'm not even saying that they need to be Republicans. I'm just saying 95% of any group voting one way, unless like the other group is just completely and uh, you know what I mean? Like actually yeah. Yeah. like legitimately against you. I know that's what people believe. I don't get it. I'm just like, well, I don't get it. Well, what's happened, uh, you know, the number is high, I think is like 80 something percent, but what happened, what happened with, uh, Trump he got more of the black and Hispanic vote than either Romney, the guy before him or McCain, the guy before him. So like Donald Trump was actually able to gain black votes for the Republicans. And, you know, that doesn't scream, you know, racist to me. Like, no. you know, and, and it's funny, you know, racist is just a thing that people use now to try to tear you down when they don't have, I mean, look, there's plenty of things to criticize Trump for. There's no question about that. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, to call him like a racist and a Nazi is just absurd. And, and this is something also that, um, people want to work on in the United States. It's like, why does the Democratic Party have such a stranglehold on the on the black vote? Uh, and we're seeing that the Democratic Party is becoming mostly minorities and single women. And in on the right hand side uh, is are are married women, married men, single men, uh, and a handful of minorities. So it, it's a very interesting phenomenon that's happening. And more and more, uh, I I read recently more millennial men single millennial men are identifying as Republican and they're, they're shifting away from the democratic party. And this is because basically it's very simple. The democratic party has in its coalition, people that think straight white men are the, are the devil. Yeah, I know. And, and and there's no way a self-respecting single white straight male who still loves everybody and is open-minded and totally believes in equality. There's still no way that that person can be a Democrat because how can you party up with people that want you basically dead Uh, as a, as a sexual strategy to prove that you're an ally maybe. (laughs) Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even joking. That sounds like I'm, I'm actually dead serious when I see some of these people in their white, armor on their white horse to (laughs) no white knight for uh, just i'm just like what are you you know i've had i mean i say this because i've had some of these type of people like attack me and try to call me some of the names that you're talking about and i'm like that's not gonna work bro calling me a nazi isn't gonna work bro you know what i mean is people try it i've I've had you know i mean i'm like people will actually try it and i'm just like if you're that that. if you're that stupid right i'm not even gonna like i might retweet you to show how everyone how stupid you are Right. I I love doing that. I'm not going to engage in someone who is so brain dead that they think a a black person, a Jewish person is a flipping. I'm just like, really? I I just think it's nuts. Like if I were if I were like a Democrat strategist after the 2016 election, I would have been like, you know, get everyone in the room and be like, look, guys, all right, 
this identity politics, this super hyper progressive crazy nonsense, demonizing people, being everything we claim to be against. We need to cut that out. We need to go back to being normal, right? And it's like instead they were like, no, like we're just gonna double down. We're gonna just double down on this. The future is intersectional. The future is female. We right. need. To, we need to. I'm just like, bruh. Intersectionality is inherently uh, an antagonistic, you know, idea. It's inherently uh, <laughs> tribalist. It's inherently anti-white male. Like Kimber, I wrote about this in my book, right? Kimberly Crenshaw is a quote unquote feminist scholar, a uh, black woman who wrote in the eighties about how white feminist feminists can't understand the black feminist perspective. Mm -hmm. And from there it's exploded. And in her original essay, she writes that white male power is implicit and understood. So like at the core of this intersectionality is the fact that white male and white male power, uh, is the core evil and the core problem facing women and minorities, especially minority women uh, in the country today. And in the only way to remedy their situation, the only way to intersectionality can can have a success is by diminishing male power. Mm -hmm. And so they have to attack male power in all of its forms. They have to attack masculinity, which they've done by getting the American Psychiatric Association to declare masculinity as a pathology recently. Yeah. Yeah, it's a that. sickness. It's now a mental illness to be competitive or aggressive or interested in taking risks or, or willing to control your emotions and not be dominated by them. This is now a pathological condition. Pretty soon it's going to end up in the, in the uh, desktop reference for the physicians where it's going to be like a disease masculinity is going to become a disease. They have to do this. They have to have the media tell everyone that masculinity is bad and wrong. They have to have the universities do that. They have to, you know, promote more, more women go to college and get college degrees today, but there's scholarships for women because they're women, because they want women in college. It's like they are attacking men and boosting women in every way possible because that's the only way to solve this intersectionality problem that they have, which is the it's, male white power. It's actually a religion. It is really. It, it is a it is a religion. I was thinking about this the other day. The whole intersectionality, hyper woke, hyper progressive thing. It's a religion, right? If you had aliens and you kind of explained to them vaguely what a religion is, and then you know you, they came down to earth and looked at people's behavior and people's words and actions, they would be like, "This is a this is a religion." They've got their own terminology. They've got um. They've got Satan. Mm -hmm. They've got like they, they they literally have their version of Satan. They've got their version of God. Um, and, and if you don't, if you don't believe you're, you're, evil. oh gosh, no, no. And if you're, if you're an apostate, that's, that's even worse, right? If right. you're, if you're a traitor, right? If you are a black person, if you are a his, I mean, look at how they treat people who are women or are minorities who do not comply. Correct. Right. You're saying we're for you. We're for you. Right? Like that, that's like someone saying they're for you. I'm like, what does that, what does that even mean? Like it, it, to me. Their whole thing is based on like past marketing, which I hope eventually fades out because I'm very hostile to this. You know, I think I think this whole idea is just is terrible. Right. And I, I don't want it to take over everything. But it's just nuts to me. You know, prime example was Kanye West coming out and supporting Trump last year. Right. The way they treated him, the way the news, some of the people in the news media were talking about him, the things people were saying, like. I was like, this is racism. Like, this is actual, yeah. legitimate yeah. racism. You're here trying to tell this, literally pretty much telling, calling this black guy, calling him, calling him these slurs, calling him an Uncle Tom, calling him a dumb N-word, calling him this and that, going on TV, laughing at him, saying that he's not welcome in the black community, saying that he's... I was just like, wow. It was already exposed to me, but I was just like, this is like a public, televised expose of who is actually being bigoted, who is right. actually being racist, who is actually assuming, you know what, because of your skin color, I'm going to judge you or you must think a certain way. If someone tries to come and tell me how to think because of what I look like, I'm like, F off, like screw off, you know? The fact that I'm a black man in terms of my, my political views or my social views or whatever, I'm like, don't assume, don't assume anything just based off of these factors because- right. Right. That is the definition of racism. You're as, you're ascribing what you think about an entire group to an individual. That's Correct. essentially what you are doing. So you're just saying, well, you're you're in this group. Like it's it, it drives me nuts. It really 
it really drives me mental. I wish it would just stop. <laughs> no, it's it's only getting it's only getting worse, my friend. And and you can see it also in feminists too, where they they claim that they're uh, they want females to be able to do whatever they want and make their own choices, except when a woman makes a choice that the feminists don't agree with. And then and then they're like, no, 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 you can't behave like that, woman. Woman, you can't decide that you want to, you know, do whatever, be a stay at home mom. Or if you want to be a traditional or let's say even on the other end, if you want to like be a sex worker, like they're not allowing women to make their own decisions and their own choices. And what it does is it reveals the emptiness of their ideology. And it really is an inferior way of thinking because it's about coercing other people into behaving how you want them to behave. And that's the bottom line, basically. Yeah. You know, I would preach a live and let live approach. You do you, I do me, just don't step on my toes and we'll be good there they you know put forth a you do what i say approach and you mm -hmm. better do it or i'm going to get the state sanctioned violence machine against you or i'm mm -hmm. going to rally these new in information networks against you to to de destroy your life i will destroy your life if you mm -hmm. do not comply i mean that's but, that's but they, where they are but they think you're the fascist <laughs> this is why we're living in crazy we're living in a crazy world a crazy time crazy place it's crazy making it will make you crazy the longer you contemplate it and and feel confused by it yeah. uh you know it's like considering our, our our location in the in the universe and like in time like the more you think about infinite time and the size of the universe the crazier you're gonna get you gotta just stop <laughs> thinking about that stuff just like this you gotta at some point you just have to stop thinking about how dumb and stupid these people are because it'll make you insane and it's hard for me to balance that because at once you know i'm i'm writing about it i'm rallying against it i'm trying to chip away at it i'm trying to give people tools uh, which is really my goal is like to help guys and women that support them to have tools to which they can fight back against this stuff on an individual basis in their own lives. Uh, because I believe the resistance to this starts at home. It starts in our relationships. It starts in our personal care and how we handle our business. And that's the way that's the way we fight back ultimately uh, by building a, a groundswell, a, a, a movement of people that don't believe in those ideas. But if you think about it too long and, and you let it get to you, which I have plenty. And it has gotten to me. They've actually tried to ruin my life. Uh, it will make you insane because it's not it's not a rational position and it's yeah. not a san, a sane, you know, sane perspective on life. I have been talking about this stuff in forums and in private message groups and stuff going back as far as like 10 years. OK, mm -hmm. and it was when I would talk about it with people like in the mainstream, it was a little embarrassing to be like. Oh yeah, feminism is a real problem. People are like, what the hell are you talking about? Feminism is a problem. How could equal rights for women be a problem? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're such a horrible person. And so you didn't I didn't want to talk about it. You know, I didn't even want to bring it up because it was kind of weird. It was kind of victim-y and it was kind of maybe I'm a conspiracy theorist, maybe I'm dreaming this up. But the reality is all of it has come in and exploded in the last six months. <laughs> With the Kavanaugh hearings oh, and good grief. with the APA guidelines, with this thing now, there's literally no question whatsoever anymore at all that radical feminism has infected every institution in America, the media, technology, Google, uh, PayPal, Facebook, everyone, all of marketing, all of the government, all of the universities, and it's found its way all the way up into Supreme Court hearings with senators in the Supreme in in Congress, using the language of radical feminism to accuse a white man of being a rapist and demanding that he be, you know, basically convicted in the court of public opinion based on an accusation of a woman because we have to believe all women, no matter what. So now radical feminism is above and beyond even the rule of law. It's above one of the fundamental uh uh, uh, ideas of the United States of America, and it is everywhere. There's no denying it anymore whatsoever. Jordan Peterson is filling, a, you know, halls with thousands of people <laughs> all across the con all across the world because people are feeling the negative effect of all of this stuff. There's no denying it. Radical feminism is a virus. It's infected everything. It's destructive, and it really it needs to be stopped. And the way that that happens is by the rise of positive masculinity and and a group of men and the women who support them 
them, taking ownership in their lives, putting themselves as their point of origin, moving forward with a mission in the world in a healthy and strong way with leadership and security. And this is the way that we do it. And I'm finally unashamed to be publicly speaking about how radical feminism is one of the most dangerous things that we face. In fact, I, I was talking to Dr. Jeffrey Miller, who's an evolutionary psychologist on my on my podcast, and he said that radical feminism in the way that it's working through our system is dysgenic. It, it is bad for our evolution. It is a it is like a, a, a an evolutionary misstep that needs to be resolved because if it doesn't, we're going to have fewer and fewer babies. We're going to have a country that falls apart. And if we can't provide uh, uh, an environment in which men and women can come together and make children, well, then that's not going to be a society for very much longer. So that was quite a rant there, but uh, I, I have I've been feeling this for years, and it's finally all coming public. And it's all, all as sad as it is, as sad as it was to lose my job, and as sad as a lot of this stuff is, there is a small part of me that feels vindicated and and satisfied uh, that my work over the last ten years and all the writing that I've done and the hundreds of thousands of words that I've written and the books and the podcasts and the tweets and all the energy I put out into this, it's all been like, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's really real and it's really mm -hmm. happening. And this not, is the you're, year. You're not this the crazy is the year. One. I am not. I am not the crazy you, one. You Zuby. are not. I was the thinking crazy for one. a minute. I was thinking I was for a minute, and now yeah. I'm not. And not only that, but this is the year that this this conversation that we're having this breaks into the mainstream. This is the year that finally people in the big publications are like, oh, you know, maybe maybe this feminine feminism thing is kind of toxic. Maybe there isn't no such thing as toxic masculinity. Maybe intersectionality is crazy. Maybe we need to look at alternatives. I, I, we're not quite just there yet, but I'm feeling it in this year, 2019. I'm feeling and, that. And maybe we don't all live in a white supremacist <laughs> patriarchy. <laughs> maybe we don't. Maybe, maybe we don't. Maybe we don't. And maybe if we do live in a patriarchy, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> Ooh, controversial. <laughs> <laughs> On that well, note. You got to drop some bombs every once in a while. <laughs> thank, thank you, Zuby. Hey, listen, That's guys, if you like the way this sounded, man, come find me on Twitter, would you please, at Jack Murphy Live. Come to my website, jackmurphylive.com. Get the book, Democrat to Deplorable. It's available on Amazon.com. There I go. I did the plug for you. Got to be done, man. Great to have you on the show, Jack. Hey, thank you very much, man. I really appreciate it. Good luck with your new venture here. And uh, next time you're in the States, man, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs>